so today, my friends, we're going to talk uh, a little bit about digital transformations into your guys' workflow and to my workflow as well. And um, this is not the first time I'm teaching this webinar, but every time I teach it, I try to put in something new, maybe a new case, uh, maybe a new addition of what I have been able to uh, find out for myself or some new technique that I try to develop. And I try to share that with you guys. So there's going to be some things that we've taught before, obviously, uh, but there's going to be some new things that we're going to talk about as well. Uh, as always, this is my contact information. Um, if you guys need to message me and stuff like this, please feel free to do so. Uh, I One thing I didn't put is my link to other social medias, but uh, just reach out to me, text me a phone number, email me, and I can send you guys links to my social media if, uh, if you guys need it. Okay, so I'm, I'm pretty happy to answer as many questions as you guys have. Uh, I love sharing and uh, I love coming up with new ideas. Uh, I like taking other people's ideas and passing them off as my own. Uh, not intentionally. Most of the time I'm really good at inventing things that have been invented by other people and only to find out that I'm not the original inventor. <laughs> so let's move forward. So embracing the emerging digital denture fabrication with traditional best practices. And uh, I try to say that 10 times fast every morning, but somehow I usually fail. Whether you are fabricating your restoration, the analog way or the digital way, the basic principles remain the same. We're looking for a restoration that's going to be functional, that's going to be aesthetic, and that's going to work with your patients. Because sometimes, guys, no matter what you do, sometimes you will end up with the best looking denture and with the best functioning denture but your patient is not going to like it so we have to understand that we're dealing with individuals here we have to kind of try to accomplish the best possible outcome for that patient because ultimately we're working for that patient now we don't want to do anything outside of the norm that's crazy right because we don't want to hurt our patient we don't want to create any kind of uh, situation where we can, might get sued and stuff like this, but within reason, we want to try to accommodate our patients as much as possible, okay? So majority of this lecture, I'm going to try to show you guys actual cases, and we're going to talk about uh, little differences in those cases and how they um, help me out to get the best possible outcome. Now, for this particular patient, uh, we had a full upper and a full lower immediate dentures. Now, those dentures were not made at the same time. So when this patient presented initially, uh, she had uh, a lot of her lower end additions still, uh, which was terminal and needed to be taken care of, but at the time she did not want to do it. So she wanted just an upper done. And with her, because of her periodontal issues, we had a difficult time taking an impression because her teeth were just like flopping in the wind, right? It was like, as class, uh, class three mobility on those teeth uh, because of severe periodontal involvement. So these are the type of cases where digital really shines because what you are able to do is you, you can use your intraoral scanner to take a scan of the maxilla in this case and, and, and make sure you, you capture everything you can because otherwise what we would have to do is we would have to take the uh, remaining maxillary teeth and extract them first and then uh, wait for that to heal up, then take an impression, which usually takes about four to six weeks, and then fabricate a denture. Now, pros and cons to that type of method. Obviously, the uh, the con of this is that the patient has to be a dentalist for some time, uh, and you know it's not as aesthetically pleasing for them, and it can create some issues. Uh, the, uh, the good thing is that you're able to take a much better impression, and you can do a try and you can verify how things are looking, and make sure you get the best possible outcome for that case because with with uh, with immediates a lot of times you're doing a lot of guessing the downside here because the patient still had the lower dentition that that was terminal we couldn't do a great denture anyways so as you can see here it looks canted just from this picture as well you can see remnants of uh, soft tissue conditioner on the uh, maxillary mandible here's another view right there and obviously the upper is kind of falling apart a little bit uh, because it's been in there for a while, much longer than the mandibular one, okay? The mandibular one 
is looking a lot better. But you can see in this picture, right, that the patient's smile is canted because we were trying to follow the uh, patient's existing dentition on the mandible. And also we did not take uh, some kind of uh, stick bite, face bow, coise analyzer to kind of even things up a little bit. And another thing, whenever you're doing immediate dentures, right, things tend to shift on you. They, they will shift no matter what, no matter how great you're doing, because you're dealing with alveoloplasties, because you're dealing with soft tissue, uh, the bites will shift, the uh, alignment will shift, the midline can shift on you, uh, maxillary and mandibular one. So I treat immediate dentures as a temporary denture, okay? And in this case, it's, it's evident why I do that, okay? But it can give you a lot of good starting points, uh, especially for this patient. We had uh, some good ideas what we could have done. Now, we could see we have some black triangles on the uh, buccal corridors right there, right? Uh, because of the way that we're positioning teeth in regards to patients' existing dentition originally. Because she had mandibular dentition, and we're trying to make the maxillary to mandibular. So because mandibular was closer to the center of the ridge, and we're trying to uh, create things within that range, we had to bring... Um, uh, maxillary dentition slightly more palatal in order to uh, create optimal occlusion. And then when we had to make the uh, mandibular one, we just matched the maxillary one. Whenever you're dealing with a set, you can uh, utilize model analysis, which if you guys look at some previous webinars and some ones that I'm going to be teaching further, it teaches you that within that range, you can move the dentition slightly buccally and slightly lingually in order to eliminate cross bites in order to increase uh, possible aesthetics for your patients. So this is actually uh, what her mandibular teeth looked like uh, before we had to do an extraction. This was an emergency extraction. These are bladed implants. Uh, she had it done uh, in Moldova in early 2000s. They haven't used this system in the States uh, for many, many years, since the 80s or even 70s, if I remember correctly, because uh, it was highly problematic uh, in a lot of cases, causing a lot of inflammation, uh, causing a lot of infection, a lot of bone loss. And the reason we actually had to do emergency extractions for this particular patient is because uh, her infection got in so bad that she started to get numbness because of the damage that it was causing to her inferior alveolar nerve. So that's kind of a scary thing, right? All right, so one of the methods that I like to utilize is taking patients' existing uh, dentures and using them as a, a custom tray. That's, this technique has been called different names. One of the more common ones is a reference denture technique. There are some issues associated with that technique, one of which was before we got to digital, it was a little problematic to fabricate uh, those reference dentures because you would have to take uh, patient's existing denture and you have to flask it and inject it with acrylic uh, with diff many different ways of doing it, but it was just time consuming. Nowadays, that technique is a lot easier to uh, to do because all you basically are doing is you're taking a, a nice 360 degree scan of patient's existing dentures and printing a replica of it. Now, some things to consider, uh, whenever you're dealing with these type of situations, uh, you need to uh, take a look at the patient's existing dentures and see what issues those dentures have. Now, if you have severely worn dentition, severely collapsed bite, um, don't have very good aesthetics, uh, your midline's off, things are off, um, use those uh, dentures mostly for Impressions, use them as custom trays. Uh, if you have a little bit of a better situation, you can use them for custom trays and use them for you, uh, establishment of your vertical dimension and maybe taking a bite. Now be aware, if you have severely worn posterior dentition, a lot of times your patients will start to get prognathic. You know, their, the mandible is going to start moving and getting into a class three occlusion, which is not a, a proper uh, occlusion uh, for that patient is an acquired occlusion. So a lot of times you'll have to incorporate something like a gothic arch tracing, which I'll show you guys a little bit later. But for this patient, since the immediates were fairly new, uh, the vertical was pretty much close to where it needed to be. Uh, the bite was pretty established by that point because she was wearing that for about six months to a year. 
so that her body would, would stabilize. She didn't have enough time to wear down her posterior collusion, so it wasn't causing any kind of prognathic issues. Um, so we were actually able to utilize that for her bite registration as well. So these are the things to consider. Now, the problem that I didn't foresee and I actually missed in the beginning, I did not realize that the immediate mandibular denture that we fabricated was missing the retromolar zones and was missing it pretty severely. So pay attention to those things as well. If you're dealing with a clinical situation and you're taking those impressions, make sure you visualize the entire soft tissue area and make sure you can see uh, how it relates to your existing prosthesis. Because what I basically started doing, I started doing a little bit of border molding with medium uh, body in this case, and then doing a live body wash. And I started seeing that it actually was making things worse. Usually when I see that, it could be one of two things. The most common one is I did not reduce the periphery of the denture initially. And by adding additional impression material, I was causing the impression to overextend and uh, causing the denture to be less stable. But in this case, it was something different. The entire posterior region of the retromolar zones was missing in this uh, mandibular denture. So I had to come up with a way to extend that first, okay? which I utilized a uh, border molding compound in this case, and you could see how much <laughs> room we were missing initially and how much I had to build that up. Now, whenever you're dealing with compound, you have to be really careful because it's very technique sensitive and also it doesn't uh, work well uh, on bonding as much sometimes. And also it's very brittle. So if you're kind of moving stuff around, it can dislodge on you. As you can see right here, I kind of had some issues of things moving on me a little bit okay, right there. So one other thing I started using recently, and I've talked about it before, is thermoplastic beads. Now, there are many different companies that make intraoral thermoplastic beads uh, for border molding. And you have to be uh, kind of careful with how you use it because they require a little bit amount of heat to get it done. And if you don't do it properly, a lot of times you can actually overextend your impressions uh, more than you need to. And same thing with compound. So also you have to utilize it properly. So make sure it's not too cold when you're doing it, but also not too hot because you don't want to burn your patients. Okay. So once I've extended the areas where I needed to extend them, then I border molded those uh, other areas with uh, some medium body. Now, whenever you're working with impression materials and you're working with reline impressions in this case, uh, you need to understand that different materials work for different situations. Now, if you have a close fitting tray, which is what basically reline is, and, and in this case, a reference denture, uh, you don't want, you want to be using any kind of like heavy body unless you have a lot of shortness on your uh, borders, okay? Usually when you have a closer fitting tray and your borders are almost to the edge, you want to use either light body or medium body if it's a little too short. Okay, most of the time I use either light body or extra light body. If you're using a custom tray that's shorter, quite a bit shorter for where you need to be, that's where the border molding needs to come in. And in this case, is you also use heavy materials if you're missing part of the ditch. Hope it makes sense. So I use medium body to border mold the areas a little bit because it was a little too short for me. Also because I kind of trimmed it up a little bit. And then I use light body to kind of give it a wash. Now, these little show throughs that you're seeing. Uh, they're not problematic. It's basically I'm utilizing that as a tissue stop of the denture. So I'm having really good retention, having no issues. And if you look closer, you can actually see uh, still uh, areas where those implants were taking out because the tissue kind of healed in inward a little bit. Okay. So now that I got those records, I actually poured up those models in traditional way and I mounted them in traditional way. But then I decided to take that case in digitally. What you will find out about me, guys, is I'd like to utilize different techniques wherever, wherever uh, it's possible. Because what I'm trying to do is to get the best possible outcome for my patients. And uh, sometimes digital is the best way to do it, sometimes analog. So I'll combine the two uh, to get the things going. Now, you'll see a lot of people that try to do only analog. You'll see a lot of people that try to do as much digital as possible. 
for example, um, if you try to do a case that's not an immediate denture, if it's a case that is for a regular full upper, full lower tissue supported removal prosthesis, and you try to take your final impressions with a scanner, for example. What I have found out is that it's very difficult to get the proper uh, border molding areas of, of, with a scanner and to make sure you, you develop the periphery where it needs to be. Now, for initial impression, I have no issues doing it with a scan whatsoever. If you're able to get a good uh, peripheral scan of things. Now, with me, it can be sometimes problematic, especially when you don't have any landmarks to go off when you're dealing with fully edentulous patients. So I, a lot of times, will prefer to do things uh, analog way until we get to a certain point. Now, once I have the models poured up and once I have them um, mounted with those reference dentures because uh, mounted for a proper vertical dimension, I get a stick bite or something like that to make sure I have the horizontal plane well, I will try to uh, bring those into my digital world. I can do a couple of different things. Now, for this particular one, I scan things in and I create it uh, a digital setup. But oftentimes, what I'll do is I'll just basically, even if I just starting out, if I haven't made my bite rims yet, or we're talking like a fully dentulous case, I'll just scan my poured up models and I'll create my base plate digitally. I love printing base plates and I love printing custom trays, guys, because to me, I had a lot of issues uh, fabricating uh, base plates by hand. Now I was able to do so, but it took uh, it, it took some time, obviously, like anything that's worth doing takes. But I was also having issues. A majority of the issues, like especially with you have undercut areas, I would either block them out too much, or I would block them out not enough. So a lot of times my maxillary, especially uh, base plates, would drop out of the sky. Or it would, if I didn't block things out enough, I would get, you know, uh, <clears throat> get stuck on the model. And if I was lucky when I was removing it, maybe the, the base plate broke. But if I wasn't lucky, um, the model could break. <clears throat> so let me get a sip of water. So with digital, I don't really have that issue anymore. So a couple of things that I'm getting that I like with digital. I have a file of this of this model and that file stays with me for as long as i need it to okay and uh if god forbid something happens you break the model or it gets lost i've had that happen before where we're going through things and then uh in the clinic <clears throat> the doctor takes the initial models and puts them in a box and takes the master cast and throws them out by accident or the assistant throws them out by accident or things get lost when you're shipping things through mail uh, things can get lost in the mail and things like this. I will always have that data and I can print another model if I need to and I can duplicate that and make it into stone if I'm doing uh, analog processing. And I'll have that file and I'll have a file for base plate a lot of times. So it becomes very helpful to me when I go that way, guys. But for this case, what I decided to do, I, I got everything put in and then I used the uh, Vigo teeth uh, to do a, a setup. Now. With the digital system from Vita, uh, there were some limitations initially uh, that they kind of took care of it uh, now. So we had a couple of different ways of doing things. Now you have to understand, whenever you're dealing with a carded tooth, which is what this is, a Vigo tooth is a carded tooth, uh, and you're doing a setup, you need to have a certain amount of room underneath that tooth in order for the base plate not to have any holes in it. If you do not have that, then whenever you're bonding those teeth to the base plate, whether it's a milled base plate or a printed one, uh, if there's a perforation through a base plate, you cannot, you cannot longer bond that tooth to it. So that creates an issue. One way I've, uh, I've bypassed that situation, and I'll show you with this particular case, was I'll do a digital setup with carded teeth, and then I'll do traditional processing, which you, which you can still do. But as of late, they've developed an addition to their, their system to where now that same library is fully digital. Uh, it's, a, it's a separate library that you have to purchase. And uh, you can actually adjust the basal surface of the tooth to where it's no longer an issue and you can print or you can mill 
the base plate and bond those things together with no problems. Okay, so we have, we have a couple of different ways of doing things. I'm going to try to show you guys some of those. Okay, so for this one, as you can see, when I printed the base plates, I have perforations here, so I can no longer bond those carded teeth to that base plate. Okay, I can only do it uh, if I don't have those perforations. Okay, so this is the mandible one. I printed them both. And what I basically did is I just kind of stuck those carded teeth into the printed base plates. And I worked a little bit on the aesthetics with wax. And I did that for two reasons, guys. Uh, number one, I wanted to be more aesthetic. And number two, if I'm going to be doing traditional processing, that little bit of wax will allow things to be removed a lot easier when I'm doing the boil out portion of things. Okay, I hope that makes sense, guys. Okay, so at try end, I, we try to minimize those buckle corridors a little bit, so give her a little bit of wider smile. Now, obviously, we can't we can't go as far out as we want to because we're limited by our uh, ridges of what the patient has and the face type. And then after that, I basically just pr processed it in a regular analog way. So with these Vigo teeth, I'm able to use them fully digital and I'm able to use them fully analog, okay? Or as in this case, I can do half and half, okay? So it's one way of doing things. And this is what it looked like at the delivery. She was pretty happy with her results. And uh, I was pretty happy because this lady does my hair, what's left of it. Uh, and I didn't want to, I want to make sure she was happy uh, every single time. And I don't know if we have sound on this one. But you can see that I was actually able to uh, get suction on her. Even with the, you know, that pretty drastic surgery that she had to remove those implants and the healing of that area, by utilizing proper techniques and proper materials, you're able to capture uh, that, that uh, valve area and get proper suction. Uh, for your patients, guys. Okay, so we're going to go through a little bit of um, steps that I utilize in three shape to get things aligned, to get things set up uh, in order to do the digital setup for dentures. Uh, it's not very complicated, and if you do it a few times, you can actually get it down pretty quickly. There's a lot of videos besides mine, obviously, that explain this whole process. Um, and every single time there's something new coming out to make things easier. One thing I will warn you guys is that digital is not uh, just press a button and does it for you guys. It's software and all softwares are glitchy. And then some things you have to figure out. And you're moving from a 3D environment to a 2D environment. So setting teeth up digitally uh, takes a lot of practice. guys. So you need to understand that the first setup you're going to do is going to suck and maybe a second one and a third one so like anything it takes practice so as long as you prepare yourself for that and and, and go with that flow and, and try to do your best you're going to be just fine now for this case you can see we brought in a, a full upper full lower and a bite registration and in this case we're actually utilizing our bite registration as a wax rim as well okay what it will do is it will ask you for different things um, on your models and the reason why it's asking for that is because it's utilizing model analysis to approximate where things are going now these pictures are from an older version of three shape where you can see it's actually also asking you for mucolabial fold which is right here the newer versions automatically detect that and you don't need to actually mark it for them but you will need to mark the uh the incisive papilla because what it basically does it actually will uh, utilize model analysis and it, it model analysis basically says that the incisal edges of your uh, centrals are going to be seven slash nine millimeters from the center of the size incisive papilla so that's where that marking is and it's where it's going to measure that's also another reason why nine times out of ten when the um, the software uh, produces the setup for you automatically it doesn't match up with the real bite rim because it follows that ideal situation. And I don't know if it uses seven millimeters, eight millimeters, nine millimeters, or whatever to align it to, but it doesn't match your wax rim. That's why you need to have your wax rim scan inside the software in order to uh, get things lined up. For the K9 points, what it basically is utilizing, where you're going to be marking it, is 
uh, you're going to be using your first major pair of palatal rugae. And that usually corresponds to the centers of your canines. So it's going to look at those marks and it's going to try to find the best possible mold uh, that you need for that particular setup. You can obviously change it down the line where you, you, you want, but it's going to line things up for you. And it's also asking you to uh, mark the tuberosities, the centers of your tuberosities, uh, because we also know that we don't want to do any kind of addition placement on your tuberosities as well. So that's part of the things that it's doing, but also centers of the tuberosities allows you to line up with the centers of your ridges, and it kind of goes with that position and makes sure that the teeth are as close to the center of the ridge as possible. Okay, hope that makes sense, guys. So same thing for the mandible, you're going to be looking at the center of the ridge. Now, the center of the ridge is important because if you guys know model analysis, the basal surface of mandibular interiors needs to be sitting on the uh, on the ridge itself. And the uh, that mucobuccal fold, mucolabial fold, sorry, uh, is how far forward you can actually rotate and angulate uh, your lower anteriors. So that's going to give you some understanding. It will also ask you for the uh, canine points. The canine points are a little bit more difficult to determine on, on the models because there are a couple of ways to do it, actually. One states that the position of the first premolars is slightly behind the buccal frena of the mandible. Uh, and if you look right here, then I just placed them slightly ahead of the buccal frena for the canines because of the premolars are slightly behind, then the canines are going to be probably either at the buccal frena or slightly forward. So I usually just put it slightly forward because you can also see where the ridge is starting to angle a little bit. That's where the canines usually are. So I'll put those on there. Now, these, is, these are just approximations to allow the software to kind of line things up where they need to line up. What you need to understand is that it's not where it needs to be. It's just an approximation. Every once in the great, you know, great while, they'll line up perfectly for you. I'm maybe like a couple of cases I've had to tweak maybe a few things. But a lot of times, guys, you're going to have to do sub movements to your teeth. It's just inevitable. Okay. Uh, on also on the mandible, you'll see the points for the center of your retromolar pad, the buccal and the lingual areas, because what it actually utilizes those marks and your canine point also to find the center of the ridge. And it will give you the ideal position and the buccal limit of where you can move the lower central fossa of the mandibular uh, posteriors and uh, where you can move it lingually, just to optimize the possible occlusion and also give the best, uh, best aesthetics to the patient as well. So on the maxilla, you can move things out a little bit out, a little bit in if you need to. Most of the time I move things out outward because your, mandible, uh, your maxilla will resorb upward and inward already. So uh, you don't generally have to move things more inward if you're, if you're trying to maximize things. You usually have, want to move them outward. And on the mandible, that's where you're probably going to try to move things inward a little bit because the mandible goes downward and outward, okay? So to optimize things, you're going to move things lingually a little bit possibly. You don't want to move it too much because you don't want to crowd the tongue space, causing some other issues. Uh, but the software is going to help you guys out with that, okay? Then you give your outlines for the, uh, for the base. Now, this is where I kind of... For this particular uh, screenshot, you can see I really took care of one around every single Frena to make sure things are great. But in reality, guys, I'll go outward and not pay too much attention to it because oftentimes I'll just print it as is. And then just you have to finish those prints by hand anyways because they have supports, right? And you want to make sure they adapt to the model better. So I'll be doing that on a lathe with a handpiece anyways. So I don't really need to... Uh, pay too much attention to make sure like every little crevice is um, blocked out perfectly. Speaking of blocking out, guys, what's great about um, that software, it actually will give you a block out of the path of insertion uh, where you need to go, as you can see right here in this picture. So I skipped the slide. It's pretty much the same thing on the, on the mandible as well. But you can see that I've rotated things a little bit and I blocked out just the front portion of it. It's very important to do that, especially if you're going to be doing a try-in. Now, if you're going from that 
directly to delivery and you don't have major undercuts, you don't have to block out the minimum ones because you're probably not going to be, especially like immediates, you're not going to be fitting into the model. You're going to be fitting it directly to the patient. But with these kind of cases where we're doing a try-in, you want to make sure you block things out. And also when you're fabricating like base plates, you want to make sure you block things out. Uh, it usually blocks out three degrees, which is perfect. And things with minimal adjustments fit the models real well. And I have no problems with it. And I really like doing that. Now you can change the path of insertion on things. You could look right here, see the block out angle is three degrees. But if I want to rotate things and change the path of insertion, I'll just rotate it from the view that I want and I'll just click this button. This is set from view. So that really helps us out quite a bit, especially on the maxilla, because a lot of times what happens, especially with three shape, I'm not 100% sure on how things are with Exacad, but with three shape uh, on the maxilla, it'll kind of line up things like straight down. And a lot of times, if you have like a major anterior undercut, it will block out way too much. And then you'll have like a puffy lip uh, issue there. So I'll just rotate the model slightly to minimize that view. So you have less of an undercut to block out and it'll work a lot better. Okay. And then you basically just do your setup. Now you, you, I'm choosing the, uh, see here I was using the buckle setup uh, for the uh, Vionic Vigo. Now you can choose buckle setup, you can choose lingualized setup, or you can choose Gerber lingualized. Uh, I recommend just doing lingualized. Buckle has a little bit of a better, um, sometimes aesthetics to it. Um, but lingualized is, is I, I like doing lingualized setups, guys, a lot, a lot of times because you're only dealing with um, central fossa of lower uh, of lower posteriors, and you're dealing with the palatal cusps of the maxillary posteriors. It's a lot easier to adjust. I generally don't adjust uh, palatal cusps uh, of the maxillary posteriors because that's my cutting surface. What I will do is I'll open up the fossas of the mandibular teeth because it will give me a broader area which I can work within. And especially with older patients where you have a wider immediate side shift, I'm able to uh, kind of get into nice uh, occlusal position without having to destabilize the mandibular denture. I hope that makes sense, guys. Okay. And as you can see right here, I've dropped one premolar because I don't want to be going up a certain point. You can see that red line in the posterior. So green line is where occlusion is okay. Red line where it becomes to, to, to get, it becomes to get, I can't believe I just said that. It starts to get destabilized in area, in that area. So basically what happens is that on the green zone, when you're going into the occlusion, you have vertical forces going onto um, mandibular denture. Once you start putting occlusion in the red zone, you start getting vertical and horizontal forces kind of tipping the denture up. So you don't want to get your teeth back back there too much. So I will usually drop a premolar, like a second premolar, because I don't want to drop a, a second molar in this case, uh, because the wider the tooth is, the more chewing surface you guys have, and it, the more um, ability to function you also have. Okay. Now you can see right here, uh, and that kind of is an issue with software. Whenever you drop, sorry, I'm gonna go back. Whenever you drop the tooth, things don't line up very well, right? You can see that the premolar is lining up with the canine, but then my first molar is like way out here. So you're going to have to guys rotate things a little bit to adjust things uh, when you're dealing with those type of situations. Same thing with the mandible. Mandible doesn't look as bad, but the maxilla definitely does, okay? And then we'll just adjust everything to the plane of occlusion. You can use the articulator to make sure everything's functioning properly. And you could see those marks where you'd go into protrusive and lateral protrusive movements. And if everything looks great, uh, then you can just finish up your gingiva. And then I showed you all the other steps where you go from there. Okay. Now, here's another case that I want to show you guys, which is a similar situation. Patient has existing dentures, uh, and we wanted to create something for them that they're going to like. Now, they don't like their existing dentures. They're not staying in very well. Uh, the occlusion is worn out, so they're not as, uh, they can't function as well. They can't uh, chew their food as good, as good as well. I don't know what's the proper way of saying it. So, and they're using a ton of adhesive to keep it inside. So, 
you can see right here. So you can see the posterior dentition who has worn out. Uh, they have a more collapsed bite. Uh, they're putting a lot of pressure on those anterior teeth. Whenever you have that, you can a lot of times we'll see that you're getting a lot of breakage on those anterior teeth. So it's time to fabricate something new. And you can also see that you have two premolars and one molar, and the denture just stops right there. So that kind of tells me that we're not we're missing quite a bit of denture here somewhere. That often happens when your impressions for your dentures are not properly done and the denture is fabricated and the patient's feeling a lot of discomfort in that area and the clinician will start to adjust it and adjust it and adjust it till that whole area is gone. Now, your patient is no longer feeling any pain in that area, but the denture is also not retaining because that whole area is gone. So that's something to remember, guys. So uh, we we're checking a couple of things here. We did a little wash uh, with soft conditioner for this patient. Uh, and basically, same thing. Reference denture technique, scanned everything 360, got things all lined up. Now on the lower, we knew right away that there was a lot of work that needed to be done. And there were some areas that were missing on the uh, maxilla as well. So we built those up with, uh, with compound. And a lot of times I'm looking for overextensions, guys. Uh, because dentures do not generally resort, but residual ridge resorbs. So what ha will happen is dentures inevitably will become overextended because of the resorption, and uh, you need to address that before taking a wash impression. So here I'm basically utilizing uh, extra live viscosity impression material to see where I have any perforations through the uh, through the impression material onto the actual denture base. And I will adjust the denture base so I don't have those interferences anymore. And with mandible, as I showed you guys before, I needed to build that up quite a bit to extend it to retromolar zones. I mean, we're missing like half a denture right here. So here we got things lined up. It looks like we don't need to reduce anything. Maybe right here a little bit I think I've reduced because I'm seeing some perforations here and some here. So once I did that, I did a little medium body. I could have actually gotten away with live body here, to be honest with you guys. Uh, but that medium body that I was using, I think this was a GC monoface. It had, it had the viscosity of the live body, so it worked out pretty well. And we did a wash on top of that with extra live viscosity just to get that best possible outcome for the patient. This is where I'm still a fan of taking traditional impressions for patients, guys. Because it's very difficult to get that kind of functional impression with a scanner. Because here I'm utilizing a closed mouth technique and not an open mouth technique. So I can get, really get those things moved and everything else. With a scanner, you're obviously going to be doing an open mouth technique and you're going to be doing a uh, mucostatic impression versus a, a mucodynamic. So this is a lot better in my opinion. Okay, And you can see the difference between the old denture and the new. Literally like twice the size. Okay, Here's the maxilla. I could have adjusted here a little bit, but I had really, really good retention, so I decided not to mess with it. Just mark there uh, where the uh, posterior palatal seal is. I had a couple of small bubbles, but they weren't interfering with anything, so I decided just to leave it as is. Okay, took a stick bite, because it was canted as well, and I mounted the whole thing on the articulator. Okay, once I did that, same thing as with my previous patient, I printed base plates. You can see I have uh, some holes through the base. So basically what I do for try-in when I'm doing this, I'll put the carded teeth in there. Now for this one, I wasn't using Vigo teeth. I was using Vita Pen Excel teeth. Those are my go-to teeth um, in 90% of my cases, unless I'm doing like an economy case, then I'll use MFTs. But all my premium cases and regular cases, I'm using Excel teeth, especially if I'm doing implant cases because I really like that wear resistance, guys. Okay. And uh, what I basically did is that wherever those perforations were, and the teeth were poking through. I just took a hand piece and ground those out so they weren't interfering. And this is what it looked like on the cast. I was able to do a regular try-in. Patient liked everything. We had really good retention on the mandible as well as the maxilla. And I processed everything traditionally. So in the first one, I was using teeth that could be used digitally. That are Well, these ones can be used digitally as well, obviously. But the, one, the Vigo teeth are optimized for digital because they are, have all the undercuts blocked out. And the, ba and the height of the teeth is much shorter to allow for those areas where you have uh, possibly some perforations. Okay, But these ones you can use as well. 
and this was what he kind of looked like. These are some pictures of what I how I processed it. Still using brass flasks. I, I, I catch a lot of <laughs> flack for this from a lot of people, uh, especially uh, guys that are big fans of Ivoclars, um, uh, Ivocap, Ivo-based systems. But I this is how I learned, and this is how I've been working for years, and it works for me. And clinically, I don't see any significant difference uh, with brass flasks versus injection. Now, in laboratory findings, yes, you will see significant differences with uh, injected versus brass packing because of the way that things are under pressure. But what I've seen from anecdotal evidence, obviously, uh, from the patients over the years, I didn't see any difference with fit, and I still get really good fits. And just processed it as regular, and uh, patient loved it, and uh, we had really good retention. Now, when I first tried to deliver the case, uh, I didn't have amazing retention on the mandible, and this is my protocol of doing things whenever I do deliveries. Uh, I will basically utilize the same technique for trimming the uh, reference dentures. I'll, I'll take a little bit of ultra light body viscosity impression material without any adhesive or anything, and I'll put that in there, and I'll go through all the movements, and wherever I have perforations a little bit, I'll adjust that, and it usually increases my suction a lot for these patients. Just a little tip I wanted to give you guys on those things. And same things on the facials, right? Where you're seeing a lot of kind of your lip is pushing through the impression material, like right here. Trim that up so it doesn't really force that denture out as well to help you guys out as well. So you can see me adjusting things. Now, the other way of using Vigo teeth, like you can see right here, you can just bond them directly to a printed or milled uh, base. I do not use printed bases for my per uh, permanent restorations. At this point, I am not confident enough with printed materials, even though uh, companies out there are saying it's, it's great, everything, and I, I, I'm not saying I don't believe them. I just need to see a little bit more research, guys. I've I just been dealing with this with digital world for a little bit, and I've been doing dentistry for a little bit, and I need to see a little bit of research on things uh, before uh, just saying, you know what, this is great. I'm able to use printed uh, for long term. If I see a three year or five year study saying these things work well, there's minimal staining, minimal water absorption in relation to acrylic, then I'll do it. But um, in this case, if I want to use utilize this technique, I'll probably mill a base and then just bond the teeth to the base uh, utilizing uh, 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 Vigo Bond. And you can see I kind of did a cross section here. You have very minimal spacing right there for the bonding agent, and it usually bonds very well. This is the bonding stuff that uh, you want to use. Now, be be aware that this stuff does expire, and if you wait too long, it will kind of solidify on you. Best expiration date, obviously. So you kind of don't. If you have some stuff just sitting there, make sure you kind of follow that and use them as, as soon as you can. But you can get some really decent results with digital dentures. Uh, that you can print or mail. Now, a lot of people will talk about like aesthetics and things, and and, and, and it can be an issue at times, especially depending on the resin that you're using. Some resins is like this one. I think this was the Drevi one that I was using. Um, you can get uh, resins that are, don't look very aesthetic. Nowadays, it's not really much of an issue with the newer resins. I'm using the Pack Dent uh, Denture Base Plus that it looks very well. Uh, but you can do digital cutback and, and build that up with a little bit of composite if you wanted to. If you don't want to do a uh, cutback, um, you can uh, build some stuff up with your, like your stains. Uh, Vita has recently re uh, released some really cool Vita accent stains that a lot of people are using uh, that, that, that create a lot of uh, nice results. And I use it in combination with other. Um, I, use, I usually use like Vita accent and OptiGlaze uh, together. They work pretty well. The only thing you want to do is you want to utilize uh, a curing light that will work on many different wavelengths because uh, Vita Accent, uh, is, uh, what they did is they created a stain that actually cures at the same wavelength as composite, where GC stuff, uh, it's a different wavelength for the glaze versus composite. So you can use them together as long as your curing light has both, both wavelengths. Now, this other case that I want to show, this is a newer one, guys. I didn't have it in my previous presentation. Now, this patient is, is a veteran that got wounded uh, overseas, unfortunately. He received trauma intraorally and uh, ended up with a, a traumatic brain injury. 
uh, and that he got shot in the face. So there's trauma to the palate and everything else. And they try to put them together right there, uh, you know, during combat. So they're basically not worried about occlusion or aesthetics. They're just kind of piecing them together. And as you can see right here, this is the scans of the patient. Okay. So obviously this is where the trauma was happening. So we're going to have to make a, a denture uh, digitally for this guy because we have scans. Um, but also I had regular models as well. I think this, these are actually regular models that I scanned in and created digital uh, digital models. And the reason I did that because I wanted to be able to see things a little bit better uh, what they would line up for him. Now, initially, the plan was to fabricate a traditional denture, transitional denture, and utilize that to fabricate a surgical guide to place implants. And I, I, I talked to the prosthodontist and said, listen, this is not a good idea. This patient has way too many issues. Let's try to see where his ideal aesthetics and occlusion is first. And once we do one, maybe two, maybe even three transitional sets, then we should do uh, a surgical guide and do implant placement because right now we're kind of all over the place. So basically, uh, I had a uh, Koi's facial analyzer uh, for this patient. And I have a little bit of patient's names right here, but I have permission to use the patient's face and name uh, for these uh, slides so there are no HIPAA violations here. Uh, but I got everything mounted. I identulated the patient digitally, and I did the setup. And this is where digital shines, guys, once again, because I can use, I didn't have a facial scan of this patient. I just had a picture. But I can line up my setup uh, to this patient. And I know this doesn't look ideal, but it looks a little bit better uh, than what the patient had. Uh, and we're probably going to have to close this vertical dimension on the second set and maybe on the third set maybe two slightly bigger teeth down the line um, because I also don't like the way where his mandibular teeth are, they're too high up. So we're probably going to end up closing this patient's vertical about two to three millimeters. So this is where I do print it, guys, because it's a transitional denture, and I really don't have a really good uh, outcome for this patient to start with. So I can do two and three sets without having to do a lot of work and utilizing too many materials and give the best possible outcome for this patient. So this is what it kind of looks right there. And we printed this. I actually didn't print this case. Um, I didn't have the uh, my settings for the printer dialed in. So the guys at Pagden actually printed this for me. Uh, and uh, obviously, we're going to have to adjust this chair set because these impressions were really overextended. And I, I, I left that to my uh, prosthodontist to do. But you can see his occlusion is kind of all over the place as well. So we get, because the, the way they wired his jaws were sideways because they weren't worried about you know his proper occlusion they were worried about saving his life so it's kind of a uh, interesting case we're still working on uh, and hopefully we'll give him some best possible outcomes now this next case uh, that i want to talk to you guys about is going to be about the uh, utilizing duplicate uh, duplicate techniques so three shape has an option of taking a patient's denture <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, duplicating 100% of what the patient has. Now, it's not going to give you new teeth. It's going to do the setup that you have or a patient's existing denture and making an exact replica of that. The difference between that and just scanning the denture 360 and printing it is it'll actually separate the teeth from the, uh, from the base. So you can do, like, different colors instead of just printing it all monolithic and trying to color the denture on denture base with, with composite or, or glazes. But with this particular case, we took a setup and we brought that in. Now, one thing when you do this, uh, make sure you set your plane of occlusion uh, on your scan, on your three shape exactly to where the denture is, because that has to do with the, the path of insertion of the actual teeth. And it can cause a lot of issues down the line if you don't set your plane of occlusion correctly. I've learned it the hard way, and actually a uh, buddy of mine, Min Tran, uh, kind of showed that to me and, and helped me a little bit with that, and I'm showing that to you right now. 
and che always check your scans for errors, especially, I don't know about Execat guys, but uh, three shade does not work well with scans that have even small errors there. The software I like to utilize, there's two types of software that is completely free. One's uh, MeditLink and one's a Mesh Mixer. I use Mesh Mixer to check for my scan errors and, and fix them before I bring everything into uh, three shape, okay? When you bring that in, guys, <laughs> make sure uh you remember a couple of things now you see i have one premolar and two molars here when you're selecting a denture in the order form to bring that in it's only going to allow you to choose all the teeth you can just choose one premolar you're gonna have to choose two premolars and two molars and then when you uh when you are going to be doing marking the teeth you're gonna be like tooth number two tooth number three tooth number four and it's gonna say mark tooth number five but the tooth number five is not going to be there there's a skip button right here, okay? You can press that skip button and it'll skip a tooth. I did not know that. And <laughs> for two or three hours, I was trying to figure stuff out. So I wanna show you guys this part as well so you don't have that problem, okay? Once you mark everything, you're going to outline the teeth. Now, segmentation, it's a weird way of doing it. <laughs> Uh, segmentati on in three parts. It's supposed to say the segmentation in one word. Uh, if you take your teeth that you have selected, you, you're gonna it's gonna give you like a margin line. You can see this green line right here to select all the teeth. You can select it as one piece. You could select it as three pieces. You could select it as you can see right here, three pieces, one piece, four pieces, or two pieces. I try doing it as one piece, but oftentimes it creates an issue with passive insertion and you end up with issues uh, creating, you know, creating at one piece. So I would recommend you guys to do at least three, like one central one and two posteriors. And that worked out pretty well for me. Okay. So coupling there two millimeters, coupling angle 10 degrees. I didn't change that at all. And you can see right here that I got three pieces. Now, you will oftentimes will have to adjust the height of the uh, denture teeth here. You can see right here, I had to do that because uh, it had perforation issues through the base and you don't want to have that. And I'll actually throw an error uh, in that case as well. Okay. So this is what it kind of looks like uh, where it's all segmented. Now, obviously because of the scan uh, artifacts and everything else, and we're not using a library tooth, it's just a scan of the tooth. These are not going to look as ideal as a regular uh, digital library would. But it's still a very good way. Now, whenever you're printing your basis, there's a couple of things to consider, folks. Uh, if you're going to be doing a reline on the intaglio surface of your denture, then you can go ahead and place a support on the intaglio surface because that will optimize the, the ability to place the teeth into the areas that are designed for those teeth but if you're not planning to do a reline guys you're going to have to position your uh, bases differently you want to position your bases where your supports on the outer portion of your uh, of your denture base and the least amount of supports inside those little areas uh, for the teeth now depending on your printer settings and depending on the resins that you're using you're going to have to adjust the glue space for the printed base or for the milled base, okay? Uh, because a lot of times it will be too tough to put it in there, you know, because of the shrinkage of the resin and stuff like this. So for this case, because we're going to have to do relines on the integral surface, I didn't mind placing this the um, the supports on the integral. And on the mandible, on the maxilla, guys. Uh, this doesn't have full palatal coverage, but if it does have full palatal coverage, try to position things so the, the palatal portion is away from the build plate because the amount of pulling you're going to be getting while printing is going to be the, is the closer to the build plate you are, the more forces you're going to be exerting on that print. So the further away the posterior palatal seal area is, the better it is to ad adapt to the mouth or to the model in this case. Okay. Now I printed the teeth separately. So in this case, I was using the uh, uh, pack dent uh, resin for both, for the teeth and for the base. 
and I actually printed some regular models as well. Now, you can see these are kind of implant models. So basically what this case is, the doctor wanted to fabricate a conus prosthesis, uh, but the abutments weren't fabricated yet. So I basically fabricated a temporary denture, which Atlantis was going to use to scan in as well. And they're going to do, uh, to fabricate the, the abutments to that temporary denture. Patient's gonna get that loaded, uh, wear that for a little bit. And then we actually now are fabricating the permanent ones for them. <clears throat> utilizing the same setup. Basically, what I usually do after I print things, I wash things in, uh, depending on the resin, I wash them in different different uh, solutions. Now, if I'm doing base plates, I wash them in alcohol because it doesn't really affect it any, because it doesn't have any ceramic in there. But if I'm doing uh, uh, the teeth, uh, especially if you're using a highly ceramic filled resin, which is what I'm using, I think I was using either Titan or, or Rodent, uh, or uh, sculpture, yeah, sculpture on this. You want to use a, a specific uh, solution that does not contain alcohol. I'm using, in this case, I was using Ceramco's uh, washing concentrate, which uh, cleans everything pretty well, but it doesn't leave that white film on it, okay? And you also uh, want to get things cleaned up and you want to get them dried up. And don't forget to do the math. It's a very important thing, guys. Whenever you're dealing with resins that are ceramic filled resins or shade specific resins, in this case also, uh, if you don't, if you over cure them, they will mess up your shade. So let's say, for example, this takes 4,500 cycles to cure both the resin uh, for the teeth and resin for the base. But I'll need to bond things together. I'll need to. Uh, uh, create some kind of glaze on it, uh, maybe even do some kind of composite on it. And each one of those things takes a certain amount of cycles. So you want to uh, you want to divide things to make sure when you combine everything together, you get 4,500 cycles and not less. Okay. Uh, oh, and no, not more. I'm sorry. Because if you get more, or way too more. If you're doing like in this case, I was doing like bleach three or something, uh, or bleach one. If you go more than that you're going to end up with a lot of times a green shade. So be very careful when you're doing those things together, guys. Now, in this case, I was using this glaze to bond things together. I could have used resin, uh, but uh, I decided to use the the, uh, the glaze because it just worked a little bit better. Uh, and then I stained everything up. As you can see, I'm using a combination of OptiGlaze because I like OptiGlaze red color. But on Vita accents, I like the uh, the pink and the purple. So I kind of combine the three together. And my wavelength is uh, on my curing unit combines uh, this one and this one, so I can cure things up. Now, if I'm if I'm if I'm glazing stuff on the teeth, I like to use uh, nano varnish because it's thinner, so it really shows up detail. And if I'm doing the gums, I'll use either OptiGlaze Black Bottle or I'll use the Vita Accent uh, glaze uh, clear on that. So a couple of different things I'll utilize. And this is what it kind of looked like for the temp. You can see I kind of did a little bit of accents on that. Um, the margins I've added a little bit of pink to because I was using the glaze and glaze is clear. And those margin areas were still kind of white. So I didn't like that. So nowadays I'm actually using pink to bond things together because it kind of gets into those uh, interproximals a little bit better and separates the teeth a little bit. So just a word of advice. And I use the printed models to double check and verify the um, the vertical. You guys don't have to do that. I just want to make sure I have my vertical correct for this particular patient. Okay. So this is these are the resins that I use for this particular case. Okay. Now, this next case I want to show you was done a while ago, uh, and I think you might have seen it before, some of you. But I, I want to. This is kind of a word of caution uh, type of case. Uh, because what happens a lot of times, we'll, we'll get a case, the doctor will scan the denture, they'll do a wash impression, um, and, they, and then they want you to move forward. Now, a couple of things to watch out for. If you have a denture that's missing parts and you, you do make it a replica, make sure you kind of fill those spaces in. And digital is not always the best way to do it. Sometimes you can just put a little bit of putty in there and scan it in 360. Okay. But in this case, uh, the doctor decided to take a wash impression and change the patient's vertical dimension and said, you know what, uh, go ahead and fabricate a new denture. And we're going to also make that uh, into a surgical guide as well. So whenever you do that, guys, 
it, it, it's a problem because you're changing your vertical dimension. You're not establishing a new bite very well. You're just kind of opening things up. The patient hasn't had, had time to get used to it. And if you make things right away and use it as a surgical guide to place implants, your occlusion will change. And then you're like, okay, uh, now I have to make a definitive restoration and your implants are too far anterior, for example, and you have access holes to your incisal edges, okay, because your occlusion changed. So be very careful. I recommend, guys, whenever you're making drastic changes like this, make a temporary prosthesis first. This is where digital is great. You can print as many as you want. And then once you have it stabilized, then do your surgical protocols, okay? Okay, this was still an analog way uh, of doing things, half analog, half digital, right? So I had digital printed out things, poured up the model, made base plates. This was back in the day when I was still doing analog base plates, uh, and I hated the stickiness of it too. I I haven't done I haven't done uh, analog base plates or custom trays for a couple of trays a couple of uh, years, guys, and I haven't been happier. I'll be honest with you. So regular setup. They wanted me to move the teeth a little bit. I made temporary dentures. And uh, for that particular patient, I also made a surgical guide. And we had nightmares <laughs> trying to fix that case down the line. Whenever you're not sure about things, Gothic Arch Tracer is a great way of doing things. And before we kind of had a nice digital way of doing it, we would do things in analog. I like analog Gothic Arch Tracers, or sometimes they're called centric bearing devices. Uh, centric trays, I mean, they have different names. I think Amon Gerbach is like Centrifix. But the downside of doing those is they cost money and you can do one at a time, right? So if you have several patients and you have one or two of these, then it becomes an issue. So the system that I've developed with some friends, uh, a buddy of mine, Mark, gave me a, um, a file for uh, one of these screws and I kind of built a whole system around it. This was before I actually built around the screw. We were still using metal screws. And now we actually just print Gothic arch tracers directly to the base plates. And I've created a couple of different ways of doing it. And I've posted it on the Thingiverse. So you guys can actually download it and use it for free. Uh, and and uh, create it for all of you guys' patients. And it, it works pretty well. Especially for cases like this, we have a patient, like I talked about, where patient's dentition is severely worn out, and they ended up in class three occlusion. As you can see right here, lower interiors are in that case. And that's not their skeletal class three, their acquired class three. So you need to get them back into their centric, otherwise things are not going to work well. Oftentimes, if I'll try to replicate the same occlusion that the patient has, the reason why they got into class three occlusion is because posterior occlusion was worn down and they were trying to bite something and they, they didn't get a lot of efficiency on the, on the molars. So they would protrude their uh, mandible forward in order to excise with their anterior teeth. And over time, we've got more and more forward to get that uh, efficient uh, biting. If you give them a new denture with proper occlusion in the back, meaning if you have proper anatomy, they can actually chew food on there. They'll start to relax and they'll start to deprogram. And over time, you'll see that the patient's bringing in, they have this anterior open bite, or as I like to call it, an alligator bite. And you'll end up having to remake the mandibular denture. So in these cases, in most cases, actually, it's beneficial for you guys to do a gothic arch tracer to minimize those problems. Okay, as you can see right here. So basically what I did is I did a setup and I cut all the posterior occlusion down and I cut out all the anterior occlusion on the mandible down as well to allow for proper movement of things. So I could do an aesthetic try on anterior six on the upper, make sure patient likes the aesthetics of it. And then I put on a gothic arch tracer in it to determine their centric relation. And from, where we could, from there we could do a proper setup. <clears throat> now, if you look back, you can see that this is kind of a problem because it's all kind of a fixed thing. So if I wanted to do a wash impression on the mandible, I couldn't do that because my my tracer is in the way. So what I would have to do is I would have to uh, figure out a way to do a couple of pieces. So the first one I try to do is I just kind of do it this way. There's no firm way to fix those together. 
So basically, if you want to attach it, you would have to use like a sticky wax to get it done. Okay, as you can see right here, I was using some sticky wax. But the last uh, way of getting it uh, adjusted, I actually develop, developed a way to get it to where we have a ball and socket joint that I can kind of place on there. So I can actually do a wash impression on the, on the mandible and maxilla if I need to. And once that's done, I can actually snap that in and do the gothic arch tracing uh, properly and do the setup from that point on. So that makes it kind of nice. And all these files are on Thingiverse. Uh, if you just go to Thingiverse and type in like gothic arch tracer or gnathometer, my name with this should pop up. If you guys can't find it, just message me and I'll help you guys find it. There are some videos attached to that. Uh, one's in Russian and one's in English. Just use the one that you're understanding to get it set up, okay? This is how I used to print things. Uh, I don't use that resin anymore, actually. I use an orange one uh, from Dentona. I think it's the resin I'm using currently. Um, those of you guys that are doing um, altered cast techniques for uh, a single or bilateral uh, distal extension partial, so it's a very good technique to utilize to make sure you have an optimal adaptation to the residual ridge so you're not putting extra forces on the abutment teeth and doing some endodontic, uh, orthodontic movements uh, and causing breakages and stuff. What I basically will do once the uh, framework is fabricated, I'll place that onto the model, get it scanned in, design in the custom trace mod, custom tray module, a little custom tray that fits over, well, actually it's not a custom tray, it's a base plate that fits over the model. I can, I actually have to go, um, sorry guys, uh, I actually have to go and connect those together because you can only design it as one piece. And this is what it kind of looks like. Then you print it and you can attach it to the, uh, to the actual metal framework, attach it with wax, and you could do your uh, try-in or you can do your wash impressions for your uh, altered casting neck. So it works out pretty well. Another thing that I love using digital on is surgical guides, guys. It's because <laughs> before what I would do is I would actually fabricate a duplicate denture, flasking it into a, a brass flask or silicone way of doing it. And then I'd have to cut those troughs in there and cut the flanges for bone reduction. And I'd be covered in all that uh, white powder <laughs> from acrylic. Look, I was doing cocaine for days. But now I just use the skin of a denture and a mesh mixer. I'll cut out the areas for the uh, approximate position of implants. And I'll just print those out. And it works out great. Another thing that I like using for cases like this, where we have to utilize a scan and an impression and kind of put those two together. Now, this case was for an obturator. They didn't draw skin because the patient has brackets here and doing an alginate with brackets kind of sucks. Um, and then I made him a little custom tray from there, but we have a defect that we need to get a little bit better impression off. So the custom tray was actually fitting up to the brackets. And then they would took a wash impression to get a much better impression of the defect. And I actually poured that up. I could have just scanned that in, but I poured that up. And then I just scanned that model. And I actually took that and I merged it with the interval scan. You can see kind of a line of delineation here because you have an area that doesn't have any pressure in it. And with the impression, you have some pressure. So it's not a perfect fit. But now I have a really good uh, impression of the defect. And I can do uh, a partial with an operator for this patient. So. That's where the digital really shines for, for me, guys. Uh, also, this is another cool case uh, that I want to show you guys. And I think, I think I might stop after that case and we can talk about uh, some questions, whatever you guys have, uh, because I wanted to give you guys a little bit of room for questions as well. If you guys don't have questions, we can, we can go further. But for this particular case, I got a phone call from the resident, and the resident was saying, you know what? Uh, we have a really hard time taking initial impressions. Uh, patient is a cancer patient. Uh, they had some grafts done. Um, they have limited mouth opening. I think they had a tibial bone graft as well. So, so we'll do the best you can with the scans. There's some pictures of the patient. 
And we also have to do immediates for them because of the radiation treatment that the patient had. You have to do like high 15 or more hyperbaric oxygen dips before extractions and that many after extractions as well. So they took a maxillary scan. I had to uh, alter it a little bit digitally right here to extend it because it wasn't going back far enough. And the mandibular scan looked really problematic. We're missing a lot of areas there. I said, well, you know what? Let me just kind of use the patient's anatomy and build that up. So I basically printed that model. So you can see on the upper, I printed it and did a duplicate because we're going to do analog on this guy. It was easier for me that way. On the mandible, I printed the model and I added some putty to it in the areas where I thought the anatomy should go. And I made a tray, but because we had a limited mouth opening, I decided to make a tray that's going to be sectional. So basically, I made a tray with some pegs in three shape. And I brought it into mesh mixer, cut the tray in two pieces, and I made the handle with the holes to kind of put everything together. So the idea was we would put it in each piece separately and then connect it intraorally together with the handle. Hope it makes sense, guys. So I had to obviously adjust some things with, with compound because the tray was too short. And then we took a wash impression with it. So this is what it looked like. So we did a model. Obviously, the fit wasn't ideal still. So I said, you know what? Let me make a base plate. We're going to see how we do that with putting it in and out. Because base plates, oftentimes, it's a little bit easier to place into orally. And basically, what we did is we used that base plate to take a wash impression for this guy. This is what it looked like. It took a bite registration. And actually, funny thing, we're able to get suction from that. So we went from not being able to take an impression at all to getting suction on this. So I was pretty impressed with it. Okay, took obviously a uh, little bites and, and took a stick bite with it as well. So we, this way we have maxillary versus mandible. That's what it looked like on the patient. And uh, this is what it looked like processed. So you can see we have a lot of defects and stuff like that. I think this would, would have to be adjusted a little bit. Uh, but overall, we had some decent results. I didn't process this case. Uh, my friend, uh, Susan Howell, processed it for me. But we actually used a Vita MFT teeth on this one. So it worked out pretty good. So this is where Digital Guys shines. Okay, You get situations where you have some problems that you can't solve easily with analog. And digital works out great for that. Okay, I think we're going to stop right here because we've got about about a little bit over 10 minutes left, and I want to answer some questions. Uh, if you guys have any, if you don't, I, I have an ability to move forward and maybe show you one more case where we go from there. All right, if you can see it, uh, those of you that are requesting asking about CE, <clears throat> uh, that will be provided to you. Uh, using the registration information uh, that you used when you registered for this webinar. As I mentioned, the workshop uh, webinar is being recorded and it will be available on the Vita North America YouTube channel in a couple days. So come visit us. Uh, if you need to get a hold of us, any one of us uh, here, your rep uh, here at the help desk, uh, please do so. Here's some information on that. Uh, the help desk, there's Paul, myself, and others that can help you out. And then, of course, we have other uh, webinars for the, throughout this uh, entire year. Uh, Eugene's got several that we've planned for and scheduled for. And as he mentioned earlier, uh, he's going to go over various topics as well. <laughs> uh, if you are interested, we do have a couple uh, international workshops in Vita, the Zon Fabric, the actual factory at Vita. If you're interested, you can certainly uh, give us a call and see about registration. It's more of uh, two days of workshop and then uh, three days of just fun sightseeing and things of that nature. <laughs> and then, of course, uh, Eugene sent us, uh, showed you his uh, contact information. Here it is again. And let me uh, see. If you guys want to scan that uh, QR code, Jim, sorry. Okay. I'll go back. If you guys want to scan that QR code, that has the links to my social media and the links to Thingiverse and all that yeah. things that I mentioned. So I'll give you a couple minutes if it's there. If it works, uh, great. And then we'll get it. go ahead and uh, answer some of your questions that you're sending in. 
So let me uh, go to that. <clears throat> and let's see here. So questions. Um, we got quite a few. Um, so uh, one of them was regarding the help of the landmarks to set up uh, premolars in the mandibular arch. What can help you if there is no buccal freedom visible? Uh, basically, um, what you do is you look at the where the arch curves. That's usually the position of your canines. Then take the carded uh, teeth in that area and just kind of measure things. So where it starts to curve, that's obviously going to be half of the canine is going to be anterior of the curve and half of the uh, canine is going to be posterior of the curve. So take a look at the canine. The usually measurement is going to be what, like three to four millimeters of that area that's going to curve. Past that point is where your premolar is going to start. So this, you're just going to have to do a little bit of math wearing there. But also remember, guys, it's just an approximation. You're not going to use those uh, landmarks for an, you know, 100% position for your teeth. So if I can't use the, can't see the buccal frena, I kind of go, okay, well, if my canine was about three millimeters here, probably another two millimeters or so, this is going to be the center of my uh, first premolar. I hope that makes sense. Right. Uh, for those of you who, uh, if the QR code wasn't working, uh, I'll bring back uh, Eugene's uh, card again that you can uh, contact him and get it from Eugene Direct if you'd like, or email us and we'll send that to you on how yeah, to get it. Yeah, I might it. have to update that thing. I think it was just having some issues with that software and that QR needs to be updated. Okay. Uh, and then how confident are you about computer to design your teeth settings versus your eyes? Well, that's a, that's a loaded question. Um, so you have to understand I come from a, analog background and I've spent many years learning how to set teeth analog so setting teeth digitally I'm a newbie I mean I'm a couple of years into it and I didn't do a ton of it because I still do quite a few analog ones um, I am pretty confident with my abilities now just because I've tried it so many times and I know little uh, little ways of optimizing things what you have to what you have to you know, utilize is make sure you rotate your work every time you're working on it. Don't just look at things straightforward. Make sure you change angles. Once you do that, it makes it a little bit easier to adjust your guys' occlusion. I, 90 times, 90% 90 of the time, I mean, I end up adjusting uh, position of my mandibular teeth uh, and, and make sure things are working out for where I need to work. Yeah, it is a transition to move from traditional to digital and start getting confidence in it. But you know, you gotta dive in and start playing with it and see for yourself. Really. Exactly. Uh, another question on your immediate dentures, um, you do it as a uh, temporary provisional, if you will, the first one. But uh, how long would it take usually until you do your first uh, reline or go to the, your permanent denture? So you want to uh, optimize your immediate dentures for as long as possible. Within that first year, your patient is going to be going through a lot of resorption or remodeling. If you can wait out as long as you can before making a uh, either a hard reline or making a, a whole new denture, the better. Uh, I'll try to uh, do soft tissue relines for up to a year if I can, and then I'll either do a, a hard reline or we'll do a whole new set, depending on what the immediate looks like. Okay. Especially and if I'm doing a printed one, uh, I want to do a, a permanent restoration that's either going to be milled or an All right. That's good to know. Um, kind of related. Uh, once you place your denture teeth uh, over implants on an uh, implant supported denture, how long have you observed denture teeth to last? So uh, we're talking about traditional denture teeth. That's we're probably talking. carded teeth, yeah. yeah. Resin, printed teeth are probably not very long, but yeah. Yeah, with printed, I, I usually do prototypes that will go for about six months or so, and they usually work fairly well for that. Uh, some better than others, obviously, but, uh, man, maybe on average or on average, I'm thinking, and I only done a couple of, re, uh, uh, retreads with Vita teeth. And one of them is because patient would 
chew through everything. Like we had to put ceramic teeth on this patient because they would just obliterate everything. Um, I would say you probably at least five years. Yeah. Because 90% of the cases I've done been have been in the mouth for five years. I haven't seen back. Now that could mean two things. It could mean the teeth are really great or I'm really horrible at my job. And the patient's like, no, I'm not going to see that guy ever again. So that we call that geographical success in those cases. No, but with, with uh, Vita Pan Excel teeth, guys, you have to also understand uh, you have to properly utilize your processing techniques. Because some of you will give me a call and be like, listen, I hate these teeth. They're breaking and they're chipping. I'm like, well, what, how are you deflasking this? Well, like I just take a hammer and I just beat the crap out of it. Part of my French. I'm like, yeah, well, they have a lot of ceramic in it. And ceramic teeth don't like to be deflasked that way. So yeah. if you look at some of my other videos or my webinars, I talk a lot about processing either ceramic teeth or highly filled ceramic acrylic teeth. And there's a way to do it. And uh, I've been utilizing that technique for years and been getting really good results with it. Yeah, there is a there is actually a technique. You just can't get, like you say, you just can't go in there and take snippers and just start yeah. snipping everything away. And, you know. I do like a little envelope technique to, for deflasking because I use like a, a first layer. Well, I'll do my first pour. And my second pour, when I do it, I'll, I'll open up the tops of the teeth a little bit. I'll let it set up or I'll do like some kind of separating tissue and I'll do my third pour. So when I'm deflasking it, I can take my third pour off really easy. And my second pour, I'll go from the distals and just open up as an envelope. And it doesn't cause any kind of lateral pressure on the teeth and it doesn't cause any problems. Yeah. Kind of old school stuff, which is yeah. good. Yeah. <laughs> techniques that, you know, ideas, techniques that are being lost to the, well, yeah. I've learned this technique from University of Michigan podcast series from 1960s, back when they're still using porcelain teeth, and yeah. it works out great. It works. Yeah. I, you had mentioned that you keep your file, and I guess one of the questions is, <clears throat> how long do you think that file is good for? I mean, at, at what point, do you, how long do you think the ridge, obviously it's patient to patient, whether it's immediate, but if they've got it, you've got a scan, and file of the, the ridge, how long would you keep that before you say, nah, I, I need a new scan or impression? Well, basically, uh, I, I, uh, what I'd like to do is whenever if something happens or the patient comes back, even three or six months later to get that replaced, I'll basically print out uh, a base plate to that file and I'll just have them take a wash impression wash. and I'll create a brand new file. And then that way I can keep, keep going I, I don't like to throw anything away, obviously, but yeah. I like to update things as much as possible. Yeah, it's, it's nice to have those files so around yeah. just in case. It's a great starting uh, point, no matter what. Yeah. Uh, last question on uh, your maxillary on the Long Branch Rue guy. If that's missing or not visible, um, any uh, a guesstimate where you try to place the uh, cuspids? So you basically, know. you look, well, ideally, you'll have a wax rim. And ideally, your clinician places the canine lines. Ideally. <laughs> ideally. <laughs> ideally. But we don't live in an ideal world. So look at the things from the perspective of also the curve of your actual, uh, of, your, of, of your arch. Where things start to curve, that's usually yeah. where the canine position is for the maxillary as well. You can kind of compare things, guys. Take a look at some models and compare things. Over time, you'll you'll start to kind of visualize. Or we usually end up with canines in this area, um, and you'll be able to kind of visually um, get things going. And also, once again, it's an approximation. This is why we do try-ins. This is why I'm not a fan of two two appointment dentures. Okay, you'll have some companies out there going two appointment dentures, one and done. No, listen, the, the, you're doing a full mouth reconstruction, and those appointments are there for a reason. So if you chose a mold that maybe it's too small or too large, you have an ability to switch out those molds and do a reset. All right. Well, thank you, Eugene, and thank everyone for joining us today. Um, any last parting words before we uh, get you off to yes. your day? One thing I forgot to mention, guys, and it's, I think it's kind of important. When you're doing printed dentures, uh, you usually have no issues with uh, – doing a hard reline, like an acrylic reline, because it bonds really well. The issue you're going to have is doing like a soft reline, either silicone or soft tissue conditioner. 
So make sure you use the type of product that will allow you to do those. I don't know of any tissue conditioners that work really well on a lot of printed uh, cases, but I started using a silicone one from PacDev and it has been getting some pretty decent results for those kind of things. So do your research, guys. Uh, we got a, a last minute question. How do you make base plates for a resorbed ridge? Well, uh, basically you guys need to uh, understand your impression techniques for that. Uh, most important thing is your initial impression needs to have all the needed anatomy in it. And I like to take uh, overextended initial impressions. And once you do that, you can, uh, for the mandible especially, you can utilize a technique called myostatic outline to make sure your custom trays are nice and short because you don't want to have overextended custom trays. And a close fitting tray is the best. And then you create your uh, final impression. And your final impression should be exactly the outline for your base plate. You can't just uh, just kind of guess where the resorption needs to be and where to make the tray. You have to determine that clinically. All right. Well, thanks again, Eugene. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, unless, Eugene, you got a, any last-minute uh, comments? Uh, I think that's about it, yeah. We'll, we'll let you get back to work and become productive and make yourself some money uh, like everybody else. I uh, appreciate you joining us. Thank you, everyone. Uh, please see the uh, follow-up of the video, the recorded video on the Vita North America YouTube channel. That'll be uh, provided in a couple days, as well as your CE. So, Eugene, thanks again. Great knowledge, a lot of information. Appreciate it. You have yourself a great day. You too. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you.